The Little Prince by Saint Antoine Exupéry. On the fifth day, thanks again to the sheep, another secret of the little prince's life was revealed to me. Abruptly, with no preamble, he asked me, as if it were the fruit of a problem long pondered in silence, if a sheep eats bushes, does it eat flowers too? A sheep eats whatever it finds. Even flowers that have thorns? Yes, even flowers that have thorns. Then what good are the thorns? I didn't know. At that moment, I was very busy trying to unscrew a bolt that was jammed in my engine. I was quite worried, for my plane crash was beginning to seem extremely serious, and the lack of drinking water made me fear the worst. What good are thorns? The little prince never let go of a question once he had asked it. I was annoyed with my jammed bolt, and I answered without thinking. Thorns are no good for anything. They're just the flower's way of being mean. Oh, but after silence, he lashed out at me with a sort of bitterness. I don't believe you. Flowers are weak. They're naive. They reassure themselves whenever they can. They believe their thorns make them frightening. I made no answer. At that moment, I was thinking, if this bolt stays jammed, I'll knock it off with a hammer. Again, the little prince disturbed my reflections. Then you think flowers... Not at all. I don't think anything. I just said whatever came into my head. I'm busy here with something serious. He stared at me, astounded. Something serious. He saw me holding my hammer, my fingers black with grease, bending over an object he regarded as very ugly. You talk like grown-ups. That made me a little ashamed, but he added mercilessly. You confuse everything. You got it all mixed up. He was really very annoyed. He tossed his golden curls in the wind. I know a planet inhabited by a red-faced gentleman. He's never smelled a flower. He's never looked at a star. He never loved anyone. He's never done anything except add up numbers. And all day long, he says over and over again, just like you, I'm a serious man, I'm a serious man. And that puffs him up with pride. But he's not a man at all. He's a mushroom. He's a what? He's a mushroom. The little prince was now quite pale with rage. For millions of years, flowers have been producing thorns. For millions of years, sheep have been eating them and all the same. And it's not serious. Trying to understand why flowers go in such trouble to produce thorns that are good for nothing? It's not important. The war between the sheep and flowers? It's no more serious and important than the numbers that the fat red gentleman is adding up? Suppose I happen to know a unique flower, one that exists nowhere in the world except on my planet, one that a little sheep can wipe out in a single bite one morning, just like that, without even realizing what he's doing. That isn't important? His face turned red now, and he went on. If someone loves a flower, of which just one example exists among all the millions and millions of stars, that's enough to make him happy when he looks at the stars. He tells himself, my flower is up there somewhere. But if the sheep eats the flower, then for him, it's as if suddenly all the stars went out. And that isn't important. He couldn't say another word. All of a sudden, he burst out sobbing. Night had fallen. I dropped my tools. What did I care about my hammer, about my bolt, about thirst and death? There was, on one star, on one planet, on mine, the earth, a little prince to be consoled. I took him in my arms. I rocked him. I told him... The flower you love is not in danger. I'll draw you a muzzle for your sheep. I'll draw you a fence for your flower. I... I didn't know what to say. How clumsy I felt. I didn't know how to reach him, where to find him. It's so mysterious, the land of tears. I soon learned to know that flower better. On the little princess planet, there had always been very simple flowers, decorated with a single row of petals so that they took up no room at all, and got in no one's way. They would appear one morning in the grass and would fade by nightfall. But this one had grown from a seed brought from who knows where, and the little prince had kept a close watch over a sprout that was not like any of the others. It might have been a new kind of bobab, but the sprout soon stopped growing and began to show signs of blossoming. The little prince, who had watched the development of an enormous bud, realized that some sort of miracle apparition would emerge from it, but the flower continued her beauty preparations in the shelter of her green chamber, selecting her colors with greatest care and dressing quite deliberately 
adjusting her petals one by one. She had no desire to emerge all rumpled like the poppies. She wished to appear only in the full radiance of her beauty. Oh yes, she was quite vain, and her mysterious adornment lasted days and days. Then one moment, precisely at sunrise, she showed herself, and after having labored so painstakingly, she yawned and said, Ah, I'm hardly awake. Forgive me. I'm still all untidy. But the little prince couldn't contain his admiration. How lovely you are, aren't I? The flower answered sweetly, and I was born at the same time as the sun. The little prince realized that she wasn't any too modest, but she was so dazzling. I believe it is breakfast time, she soon added. Would you be so kind as to tend to me? She had soon begun tormenting him with her rather touchy vanity. One day, for instance, eluding all her four thorns, she remarked to the little prince, I'm ready for tigers with all their claws. There are no tigers on my planet, the little prince had objected. And besides, tigers don't eat weeds. I'm not a weed, the flower replied sweetly. Forgive me. I'm not at all afraid of tigers, but I have a horror of drafts. You wouldn't happen to have a screen. A horror of drafts. That's not a good sign for a plant. The little prince had observed how complicated this flower is. After dark, you will put me under glass. How cold it is where you live. Quite uncomfortable. Where I come from. But she suddenly broke off. She had come here as a seed. She couldn't have known anything of other worlds. Humiliated at having let herself be caught on the verge of so naive a lie, she coughed two or three times in order to put the little prince in the wrong. That screen? I'm going to look for one, but you are speaking to me. Then she made herself cough again, in order to inflict a twinge of remorse on him all the same. So the little prince, despite all good will of his love, had soon come to mistrust her. He had taken seriously certain inconsequential remarks and had grown very unhappy. I shouldn't have listened to her, he confided to me one day. You must never listen to flowers. You must look at them and smell them. Mine perfumed my planet, but I didn't know how to enjoy that. The business about tiger claws instead of annoying me ought to have moved me. And he confided further. In those days, I didn't understand anything. I should have judged her accordingly to her actions, not her words. She perfumed my planet and lit up my life. I should have never run away. I ought to have realized the tenderness underlying her silly pretensions. Flowers are so contradictory, but I was too young to know how to love her. In order to make his escape, I believe he took advantage of a migration of wild birds. On the morning of his departure, he put his planet in order. He carefully raked out his active volcanoes. The little prince possessed two active volcanoes, which were very convenient for warming his breakfast. He also possessed one extinct volcano. But, as he said, you never know, so he raked out the extinct volcano, too. If they are properly raked out, volcanoes burn gently and regularly, without eruptions. Volcanic eruptions like fires in a chimney. Of course... On our earth, we are much too small to rake out our volcanoes. That is why they cause us so much trouble. The little prince also uprooted, a little sadly, the last boabab shoots. He believed he would never be coming back. But all these familiar tasks seemed very sweet to him on this last morning. And he watered the flower one last time and put her under a glass. He felt like crying. Goodbye he said to the flower, but she did not answer him. Goodbye, he repeated. The flower coughed, but not because she had a cold. I've been silly, she told him at last. I ask your forgiveness. Try to be happy. He was surprised that there were no reapproaches. He stood there, quite bewildered, holding the glass bell in midair. He failed to understand this calm sweetness. Of course I love you, the flower told him. It was my fault. You never knew. It doesn't matter, but you were just as silly as I was. Try to be happy. Put that glass thing down. I don't want it anymore. But the wind. My cold isn't that bad. 
The night air will do me good. I'm a flower. But the animals. I need to put up with two or three caterpillars if I want to get to know the butterflies. Apparently, they're very beautiful. Otherwise, who will visit me? You'll be far away. As for the big animals, I'm not afraid of them. I have my own claws. And she naively showed her four thorns. Then she added, Don't hang around like this. It's irritating. You made up your mind to leave. Now go. For she didn't want him to see her crying. She was such a proud flower. He happened to be in the vicinity of asteroid 325, 326, 327, 328, 329, and 330. So he began by visiting them, to keep himself busy and to learn something. The first one was inhabited by a king. Wearing purple and ermine, he was sitting on a simple yet majestic throne. Ah, here's a subject, the king exclaimed when he caught sight of the little prince. And the little prince wondered, how can he know who I am if he's never seen me before? He didn't realize that for kings, the world is extremely simplified. All men are subjects. Approach the throne so I can get a better look at you, said the king, very proud of being a king for someone at last. The king looked around for a place to sit down, but the planet was covered by the magnificent ermine cloak, so he remained standing, and since he was tired, he yawned. It is a violation of etiquette to yawn in the king's presence, the monarch told him. I forbid you to do so. I can't help it, answered the little prince, quite embarrassed. I have made a long journey, and I haven't had any sleep. Then I command you to yawn, said the king. I haven't seen anyone yawn for years. For me, yawns are a curiosity. Come on, yawn again. It is an order. That intimidates me. I can't do it now, said the little prince, blushing deeply. Well, well, the king replied. Then I... I command you to yawn sometimes and sometimes to... He was sputtering a little and seemed quite annoyed, for the king insisted that his authority be universally respected. He would tolerate no disobedience, being an absolute monarch. But since he was a kindly man, all his commands were reasonable. If I were to command, he would often say, if I were to command a general to turn into a seagull, and if that general did not obey, then that would not be the general's fault. It would be mine. May I sit down? The little prince timidly inquired. I command you to sit down, the king replied, majestically gathering up a fold of his emerine robe. But the little prince was wondering. The planet was tiny. Over what could the king really reign? Sire, he ventured, excuse me for asking. I command you to ask, the king hastened to say. Sire, over what do you reign? Over everything, the king answered with great simplicity. Over everything? With a discreet gesture, the king pointed to his planet, to the other planets, and to the stars. Over all that? Asked the little prince. Over all that, the king answered. For not only was he an absolute monarch, but a universal monarch as well. And did the stars obey you? Of course, the king replied. They obey immediately. I tolerate no insubordination. Such power amazed the little prince. If he had wielded it himself, he could have watched not forty-four, but seventy-two, or even a hundred, even two hundred sunsets in the same day without ever having to move his chair. And since he was feeling rather sad on account of remembering his own little planet, which he had forsaken, he ventured to ask a favor of the king. I'd like to see a sunset. Do me a favor, your majesty. Command the sun to set. If I command a general to fly from one flower to the next like a butterfly, or to write a tragedy, or to turn into a seagull, and the general did not carry out my command, which of us would be in the wrong, the general or me? You would be, said the little prince quite firmly. Exactly. One must command from each what each can perform. The king went on. Authority is based first of all upon reason. If you command your subjects to jump in the ocean, there will be a revolution. I am entitled to command obedience because my orders are reasonable. Then my sunset, insisted the little prince, who never let go of a question once he asked it. You shall have your sunset. I shall command it. But I shall wait, according to my science of government, until conditions are favorable. And when will that be? inquired the little prince. Well, well, replied the king, first consulting a large calendar. 
Well, well. That will be around... Around... That will be tonight around 74. And you shall see... And you'll see how well I am obeyed. The little prince yawned. He was regretting his lost sunset. And besides, he was already growing a little bored. I have nothing further to do here, he told the king. I'm going to be on my way. Do not leave, answered the king, who was so proud of having a subject. Do not leave. I shall make you my minister. A minister of what? Of... Of justice. But there is no one here to judge. You never know, the king told him. I have not yet explored the whole of my realm. I am very old. I have no room for a carriage. It wearies me to walk. Oh, but I've already seen for myself, said the little prince, leaning forward to glance one more time at the other side of the planet. There is no one over there, either. Then you shall pass judgment on yourself, the king answered. That is the hardest thing of all. It is much harder to judge yourself than to judge others. If you succeed in judging yourself, it's because you're truly a wise man. But I can't judge myself anywhere, said the little prince. I don't need to live here. Well, well, the king said. I have a good reason to believe that there is an old rat living somewhere on my planet. I hear him at night. You could judge that old rat. From time to time, you will condemn him to death. That way his life will depend on your justice. But you'll pardon him each time for economy's sake. There is only one rat. I don't like condemning anyone to death, the little prince said. And now I think I'll be on my way. No, said the king. The little prince, having completed his preparations, had no desire to aggrieve the old monarch. If your majesty desires to be promptly obeyed, he should give me a reasonable command. He might command me, for instance to leave before this minute is up. It seems to me that the conditions are favorable. The king, having made no answer, the little prince hesitated at first, and then, with a sigh, took his leave. I make you my ambassador, the king hastily shouted after him. He had a great air of authority. Grown-ups are so strange, the little prince said to himself as he went on his way. The second planet was inhabited by a very vain man. "'Ah, a visit from an admirer!' he exclaimed as he caught sight of the little prince, still at some distance. "'To vain men, other people are admirers.' "'Hello,' said the little prince. "'That's a funny hat you're wearing.' "'It's for answering acclamations,' the very vain man replied. "'Unfortunately, no one ever comes this way.' "'Is that so?' said the little prince, who did not understand what the vain man was talking about. "'Clap your hands,' directed the man." The little prince clapped his hands, and the vain man tipped his hat in modest acknowledgement. This is more entertaining than the visit to the king, the little prince said to himself, and he continued clapping. The very vain man continued tipping his hat in acknowledgement. After five minutes of this exercise, the little prince tired of the game's modity. And what would make the hat fall off, he asked. But the vain man did not hear him. Vain men never hear anything but praise. "'Do you really admire me a great deal?' he asked the little prince. "'What does that mean, admire?' "'To admire means to acknowledge that I am the handsomest and best-dressed, "'the richest and the most intelligent man on the planet. "'But you're the only man on your planet. "'Do me this favor. Admire me all the same. "'I admire you,' said the little prince, with a little shrug of his shoulders." But what is there about my admiration that interests you so much? And the little prince went on his way. Grown-ups are certainly very strange, he said to himself as he continued on his journey. The next planet was inhabited by a drunkyard. This visit was a very brief one, but it plunged the little prince into a deep depression. What are you doing there? he asked the drunkyard whom he found sunk in silence before a collection of empty bottles and a collection of full ones. Drinking, replied the drunkyard, with a gloomy expression. Why are you drinking? the little prince asked. To forget, replied the drunkyard. To forget what? inquired the little prince, who was already feeling sorry for him. To forget that I am ashamed, confessed the drunkyard, hanging his head. 
What are you ashamed of? inquired the little prince, who wanted to help. Of drinking, concluded the drinkyard, withdrawing into silence for good. And the little prince went on his way, puzzled. Grown-ups are certainly very, very strange, he said to himself as he continued on his journey. The fourth planet belonged to a businessman. This person was so busy that he didn't even raise his head when the little prince arrived. Hello, said the little prince. Your cigarette's gone out. Three and two makes five, five and seven, twelve, twelve and three, fifteen. Hello, fifteen and seven, twenty-two, twenty-two and six, twenty-eight. No time to light it again. Twenty-six and five, thirty-one. Whew! That amounts to five hundred and one million six hundred twenty-two thousand seven hundred thirty-one. Five hundred million what? Hmm? You're still here? Five hundred and one million? I don't remember. I have so much work to do. I'm a serious man. I can't be bothered with trifles. Two and five, seven. Five hundred and one million what? repeated the little prince, who had never in his life let go of a question once he had asked it. The businessman raised his head. For fifty-four years I've inhabited this planet. I've been interrupted only three times. The very first time was twenty-two years ago, when I was interrupted by a beetle that had fallen onto my desk from God knows where. It made a terrible noise, and I made four mistakes in my calculations. The second time was eleven years ago when I was interrupted by a fit of rheumatism. I don't get enough exercise. I haven't time to take strolls. The third time is right now. Where was I? Five hundred and one million. Million what? The businessman realized that he had no hope of being left in peace. Oh, those little things you sometimes see in the sky. Flies? No, those little shiny things. Bees? No, those little gold things that makes lazy people daydream. Now, I'm a serious person. I have no time for daydreaming. Ah, you mean the stars? Yes, that's it, stars. And what do you do with 500 million stars? 501,622,731. I'm a serious person, and I'm accurate. And what do you do with those stars? What do I do with them? Yes. Nothing. I own them. You own the stars? Yes. But I've already seen a king who... Kings don't own. They reign. It's quite different. And what good does owning the stars do you? It does me good of being rich. And what good does it do you to be rich? It lets me buy other stars, if somebody discovers them. The little prince said to himself, this man argues a little like my trunk yard. Nevertheless, he asked more questions. How can someone own the stars? To whom do they belong? retorted the businessman grumpily. I don't know. To nobody. Then they belong to me because I thought of it first. And that's all it takes? Of course. When you find a diamond that belongs to nobody in particular, then it's yours. When you find an island that belongs to nobody in particular, it's yours. When you're the first person to have an idea, you patent it, and it's yours. Now I own the stars, since no one before me have ever thought of owning them. That's true enough, the little prince said. And what do you do with them? I manage them. I count them, and then count them again, the businessman said. It's difficult work, but I'm a serious person. The little prince was still not satisfied. If I own a scarf, I can tie it around my neck and take it away. If I own a flower, I can pick it and take it away. But you can't pick the stars. No, but I can put them in a bank. What does that mean? It means that I write the number of stars on a slip of paper, and then I lock that slip of paper in a drawer. And that's all? That's enough. That's amusing, thought the little prince, and even poetic, but not very serious. The little prince had very different ideas about serious things from those of the grown-ups. I own a flower myself, he continued, which I water every day. I own three volcanoes, which I rake out every week. And I even rake out the extinct one. You never know. It's of some use to my volcanoes, and it's useful to my flower, that I own them. But you're not useful to the stars. 
The businessman opened his mouth but found nothing to say in reply. The little prince went on his way. Grown-ups are certainly quite extraordinary, was all he said to himself as he continued on his journey. The fifth planet was very strange. It was the smallest of all. There was just enough room for a street lamp and a lamplighter. The little prince couldn't quite understand what use a street lamp and a lamplighter could be up there in the sky, on a planet without any people and not a single house. However, he said to himself, It's quite possible that man is absurd. But he's less absurd than the king, the very vain man, the businessman, and the drunkard. At least his work has some meaning. When he lights his lamp, it's as if he's bringing one more star to life, or one more flower. When he puts out his lamp, that sends the flower or the star to sleep, which is a fine occupation, and therefore truly useful. When the little prince reached this planet, he greeted the lamplighter respectfully. Good morning. Why have you just put out your lamp? Orders, the lamplighter answered. Good morning.